I, I came out to peer with the Associated Press in the fall of 1969. And um, 1970 was the first session I covered. So the first experience I had with, with a closed meeting out there, and, and remember, I'd, I'd been a sports, sports writer and photographer at the Argus for two years before that. So open meetings, open records didn't, you know, didn't really affect me, <laughs> I thought. Um, there was an interim meeting of the Legislative Research Council Education Committee, and they were gonna hear a report from Dr. Richard Gibb, who was the commissioner of higher ed on a master plan that would completely revise the state supported colleges and universities. Well, I went there and the first thing they did after they gaveled in was saying, this meeting is an executive session and somebody came over and said, you, you leave. And I didn't know what to do, I was new, so I did. And I ran upstairs to where my boss was working and said, hey, they, they told me I can't be in that meeting. And so he got huffy and we went back down and argued a bit outside and Rod and the chairman came out and argued a little bit. And then he said, well, I guess you can come in. But by that time, the report was over. So, so really, I missed I missed what I wanted to see, but that was not unusual to to have those kinds of sessions. In the in I had heard this is not a story I I know firsthand, but I heard it from from a person who saw it. I'd heard that that there were often committee chairmen who were very powerful, a lot of seniority before before term limits, who sometimes would not tell the minority party when the committee meetings were. And sometimes occasionally he wouldn't tell a member of his own party if, if he didn't want that person at the meeting. And so lobbyists, and there were fewer of them, would run around the place like crazy trying to find meetings because they were looking for bills. And I remember one where a, a lobbyist told me this, he walked in, finally found out, he walked in and the chairman held up his bill and said, we just killed this town. And he had never been there. <clears throat> my, first, wow. my first experience in, in, within the session on that was, there was a bill by Frank Farrar uh, sponsoring it to totally revise the welfare department, which is what they called it at the time. And they had a lot of people testify, uh, pretty good hearing. And then as they got ready for committee discussion, he said, okay, everybody but committee members leave. And, and they brought a sergeant at arms to help you leave. And I, I had to leave that one. So I found out later that the bill died, but I had no idea who voted how. There was no record kept of, it, of all of that. You, you went, you relied a lot in those days on the on the daily journals, because that was where official actions happened. You'd look at you'd look there the next day for amendments, which is which is why there's a day layover on amended bills before they can be voted on, because they used to bring them they used to bring them out, and then the journal would come, and people would be able to read the amendment in the journal. Well, anyway, this. One of the one of the best stories in 1970 was uh, at the end of the session. A guy from Hill City, a senator, a Republican named uh, Frank Henderson, um, had a bill, and I can't remember if it was on dove hunting, which was a big issue back then, or abolishing game fish in parks, which he always wanted to do. But one, somehow, one of them he managed to browbeat it through the Senate, and it got out of the House committee. I think that the House member, the committee members thought, you know, let, let them kill it on the floor. Um, but it never showed up on the floor. And the last day for bills, the last evening, um, it hadn't been anywhere. And Henderson came over during, during the House floor session and stomped from the back up to the front and grabbed the speaker by the lapels, Dexter Gunderson, and said, where's my bill? 
and Dexter kind of dusted off his lapels and called a recess and went back and rummaged in his office and came out with the bill, uh, which he had just stuck in a drawer and planned to leave it there. They called that pocket vetoes. Um, and, and it happened, I mean, that, that was the thing chairman could sometimes do on committees. They, they would just not take action on a bill. Mm. And let's see. That, that, I want to do a uh, circle other back thing. on that. On that, you mentioned when you started talking about the Gibb report, just to underscore how important. I mean, that was a report that that uh, they were talking about closing. I mean, was that ultimately led to like the Springfield College closing? I mean, that just to underscore how important that discussion was that they were kicking people. Yes, uh, that I mean, that turned out to be huge. It was still. It was still in the in the progress stage, but it ended up, you know, in 1972 being the big engineering school fight, where the report, as I remember it, suggested one engineering school and it be at South Dakota State, and School of Mines and Black Hills would become one combined general university for Western South Dakota. You know, in some ways that made sense, but but the School of Mines is you know, also a fair to Midland engineering school. <laughs> yeah. And and both the schools had pretty strong alumni groups. And so, and and you're right, it it did propose that Southern State Teachers College become a branch of USD and eventually that led to the closing in nineteen eighty four, I think it was. I mean there was there was a ton of stuff in there that that was highly should have been highly interesting to the public. That, that they weren't going to tell them about till they were ready um, at what should have been a public meeting. Yeah. The last one I'll go into was, was in 1971. Um, there was a, a tax bill that Governor Knight was, was a supporter of, an income tax bill, and they were always hot stuff. And we were told we couldn't be in a, a committee hearing on it one evening on a, on a state income tax bill that would, you know, do all kinds of things to the, to the effect basically everybody in South Dakota positively or negatively. Uh, my, my boss at the time was a guy named Bill Words, and he refused to leave the meeting on, and forced the chairman to call the sergeant at arms. And he stood there, he was very polite and, and very mild, but he, made the sergeant at arms taking by the arm and then he said he was physically removed from the meeting which the old guy probably couldn't have removed him forever but that you know that was another important bill that, that they decided to just have you leave hmm. well in 1973 the democrats came in and um they had a 35 35 tie in the house i think if you're talking to gene lebron he became speaker with no previous experience you know except what he picked up on his own um so it's 35 35 but because dick knipe was governor the democrats got to organize the house and appoint committees the senate was 18 to 17 democrat uh harvey woman who later became, became governor um, was the majority leader and they pushed for reorganization of of the entire way the legislature operated basically um, at the time i think the only real uh, mention of openness in the legislature was something in the constitution that said something like um, meetings of the legislature and committees of the whole shall be open unless the business is such that should be secret but you know it's pretty open one year when one year when they 71 i think when they were going to talk about picking a new auditor general they kicked everybody out of the house chamber and pulled the shades closed and locked the doors and and both house and senate went in there and you know and talked about it behind closed doors and i should say that you know the democrats did push the openness uh some of the republicans uh joe barnett from aberdeen were pretty open to it. Uh, Walt Miller was pretty open to it. He was he was uh, in the house then, and 
he was a he was a stubborn guy, but I think he saw a little bit of uh, of how it could benefit people. And besides that, he Walt told me once that his first session in the middle '60s, there was a a program where some West River group they called it a short grass bill, and somehow it involved payments that affected West River ranchers mostly. And and he swore to me that the East River Republicans and Democrats got together to talk about that in a closed session and kicked out the West River Republicans and Democrats. So, I mean, that's how far it went sometimes. Yeah. Anyway, so, so what they did in effect, they, they, they declared sunshine and Harvey Woolman told me that we're gonna throw open the windows of the Capitol and let the sunshine in. And the result was that Every bill got a hearing and a vote in public. The votes were recorded in public. Anyone could sit in and watch that process. And they've taken that a lot of steps farther since, but, but that was the first part. Uh, the votes were recorded for later use. You could go back and check who voted how. Um, each committee, had to had to post an agenda of each day's bill agenda, the bills they're going to work on, so that you knew when a bill was up. And at the time when they started, I believe they said essentially one intervening day. So you had to have two days between the time you posted a bill and the time you acted on it. So people had people had opportunities to, you know, to follow bills. And and to and to come up and, and testify, it's it's still required to be in peer, you know. But in the old days, you could be in peer, and and you might as well be, you know, in Rapid City or Sioux Falls for all the good it did you. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that was, I mean, that was a huge change. It's it 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 made it possible for citizens to really know what was going on. It did take away some of the power of, you know, of some of the old time committee chairs um, and, and some of the leaders, they still had power, but it, it made it easier for everybody to, to make their case. Um, that's, that's, that's one I, I thought was, a, was just a marvelous um, advancement for people's right to know. Now, you know, reporters are just citizens who happen to get paid to go to meetings and reports, but but everybody had the opportunity then to to yeah. check on what was going to affect them. Anyway, I was thinking, you know, about the motivation. Now I don't know when I think about the '70s. You said this was '73, right? When is that when this mm -hmm. started or went down? Okay. '73 so, session was when they was it Watergate? Maybe the reaction to that, or what? What was the motivation that's made suddenly people want to do this change in the in the legislature? I think I think some of it was Watergate related. You know, in '72, they were starting to hear the you know some of the some of the rumblings. It started slow, but it but it was growing, and people were starting to get upset with with closed government. Um, I I also think there was a push. That that quite frequently was led by reporters and editors um, in the in the middle 1960s. It seems to me there we started hearing. I was in I was in a law of the press class in 65, I think, and I first read about uh, sunshine laws. And Florida had adopted one of the one of the first ones, and so there was a push in the in the news profession to to get more openness and and there were some civic groups that said yeah that that makes sense we should know what's going on i and and the business of watergate added to it um you know as as early as 68 there were people like gene mccarthy who was ran for governor for a while and they called him clean gene until gene lebrun came along and we, we all called him <laughs> clean gene because of that, it, it just it just seems like it was time. It was um, a, a really brief aside in 1975 when when the Republicans took back over the House, um, they decided to open their caucus 
to reporters and and they they were a little they had a lot of members who were leery about it and who didn't talk very openly <laughs> during those caucuses but yeah but they huh. they tried that um as and I, I I thought well in both cases in seventy three for the Democrats and in seventy five for the House Republicans part of it was PR how do we how do we convince people that we're on their side that you know we're for the public and and whatever the motive it was a good thing to do you know and the electronic changes have only in, enhanced that. But when they, some people are meeting behind closed doors somewhere. Yeah, yeah <laughs> but, exactly. But and when hard. they did this, it was all rules changes, right? It sounds like it, yes. and not, yep. not necessarily laws, but rules. Yep. So, okay. Yep. Essentially, it was it was they changed the rules and and they've stuck with it. I suppose you could almost go back. Well, really, you'd have, you'd have trouble going too far back, given the way we've changed open meetings and open records in other areas so yeah. they'd, they'd have to really set themselves out again as as separate yeah it'd be hard so, to do did the, did the change did it change the way reporters did their job then and did it change the flow of news coming out of the capitol during the session or how, how did that work i think i think it i think it did i think it improved um it, it improved the product, you know, the the news we were able to produce, it, it allowed us to cover more things. You know, you could you could cover, um, look at two or three agendas and decide what you were going to cover, and still go back and and find the outcome of bills in another in another committee that you hadn't been able to cover, and you know, and with a couple of interviews with legislators who were there and maybe the interest groups that were supporting it, you could, you could also get stories out of that. So it, I, I think it, I think it opened it up a lot to, to reporters covering more things with the same number of people. Was there, obviously it was, it was good for transparency. Um, was there any bad that came with it? You know, before now any bill can, any bill could get a hearing. Was there ever a time that was a bad thing, or was it always good? Do you think? <laughs> well, there were there were times. I will confess, there were times when I sat in committee meetings waiting for a couple of bills when I thought, "Wow, they should never let this one in." But but that's you know that's the downside. I don't think there was ever a real downside except that except it, it did slow the process somewhat but but you, you know democracy sometimes takes work it isn't yeah it isn't, it isn't all handed to you yeah when you were talking at first i would kind of thought you know in the days before they did this it was almost like you had to be an investigative reporter just to report what was happening in the legislature, you know. It's yeah, different just, than today. I mean, stuff that stuff that people today, um, even reporters today, wouldn't wouldn't understand. They can they can be, and I, and I don't say that I don't say that in a in a bad way because I'm I admire the people that cover legislature and government today. They they have to work so hard at it and be so many places and you know and they they do live tweets and i'm just on the fly i i would have struggled with with that instant stuff because i always wanted to double check but it be, before that started yeah you ran around a lot trying to find stuff you in in my case and and the other people i knew that were covering out there you you made as many acquaintances as you could whether lobbyists or staff or uh, you know the the head of a of a group that was coming out out and certainly among all the all the uh, legislators you could find just just to you know to kind of keep track of where they were going I I always tried to have at least a few people in each party in each house that that I knew I could count on to let me know if something happened that that I wasn't able to get to. 
it was i mean it it is strange when you talk about a say a committee chairman could just go down the hall and tell four or five members of his committee hey we're meeting at seven o'clock in 423 and the other three members not mention it <laughs> you know and, i mean they're having supper and and the meetings going on it's it's took it took it had just incredible amount of power yeah and so now when i go to the capitol sometimes i'll go down to the press dungeon there and there'll be a reporter in there with audio playing from the from two different meetings covering two or three different meetings at once you know trying to listen here and there and whatever so yeah. i mean it it that has been another layer too that you can really every word spoken almost is 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 recorded basically yeah we, uh, we uh it, it, early on when i first got out there the the ap bureau which was up on fourth floor behind the house chamber and united press was on fourth floor behind the senate um we had speakers wired in that you could click to get either the house or senate floor session you didn't that didn't say anything about committees, which which we didn't get, but we could set up there, uh, you know, if we were if we were working on something and listen to make sure, you know, it's so when they got through the formalities and the this and that, and we're going to get to the bills. But we we had a practice um, in those days, and I don't know if they still do, of, of being when the House and Senate would go in, one of us would be there virtually the whole afternoon uh, when they were working on bills we were there because otherwise you'd struggle to find out what they did with bills yeah. and you know and and a lot of times amendments weren't written they these days you know the amendments they'd say uh, i want to amend this and they'd say is that uh, 312 aj yes it is well it's already been passed out to everybody in those days sometimes they just stand up on the floor and say i do this uh, i was told once that that one of the majority leaders in this in the house went up to the speaker's desk and handed in a piece of paper and the the assistant the clerk opened it and it was blank and it was an amendment and he said i'll i'll fill it in later well and then he went back and explained it and they voted on it and then the, the clerk that I, that I talked to said, wow, there was a lot more in it than, <laughs> than that, that piece of paper. But, you know, so, so good government uh, it improved a lot with, yeah. with just, being, just being open. People still don't have to go there, but at least they can. I, I would imagine the pace changed a lot, too, because I think about today, and you got hundreds of bills get filed every session. They all have to have a hearing. It's really a breakneck pace. You got two months and all these bills have to have a hearing. Um, before they opened everything up, was the pace a lot different uh, of lawmaking? It was, it, it, it's funny because I think, well, fewer bills got out of committees. Um, the pace on the floor is a lot of times was just as hectic uh and and they had it seems to me they had a lot more evening meetings um in in the early days um, i knew it was it was routine to to have committees meet after supper um i know there was there was one uh, there was one senator who had a judiciary committee and he liked to meet at six in the morning which kind of it was it was kind of rude but yeah. but the, the pace the pace had to be a little different because well here okay here's a couple of things for news and and that really isn't about public records but but we had newspapers and once a day at like 2 30 at the ap we would file a broadcast report um we we had the national wire and national radio wire and they would give us like 25 minutes across the country for for locals to file their copy and you know so we didn't have if something happened that was it's amazing at three o'clock there was nothing you did with it till the next you know till yeah. the, the night report I, I mean it, you know today 
today they have they have so many ways to to get the material out ours was just okay you, you carry that around in your notebook but you got a lot of time to write it <laughs> yeah yeah um, I, I suspect the pace was a little was slower then it seemed it seemed hard work but it but i think i think you have to balance more i think when i would when i was going further into my career you, you had to be able to juggle more things in your head through the day um i kind of wanted to wrap up with you know i think people who um pay attention to the legislature cover it or whatever today they probably just assume this is how it's always been right like we you know yeah you know but obviously you know to open this process up people had to do something right people had to act people had to have the yes. motivation and act on it but what do you what do you is there anything you'd like to say about that i mean it's it's really kind of a lesson in in civics isn't it that you know how these things happen it it is it took it took some good people you know and some some good hearted people and this was this was in both parties back then because there wasn't a lot of big fighting over this process i mean, I mean it there was some, but it wasn't. It, it was people saying, "Well, that's going to be tough." I think. I think at all levels, and you know, given given that I'm talking to you right now, this made data, but on Sunshine Week, which is an important <laughs> week for us, um, it takes people paying attention, and and it and it, it ought to fall on on every citizen you know to help pay attention because because we're all in it together sometimes you know like i say reporters are just citizens who who, who set through meetings and and read read audit reports and budgets and there the the changes in the early 70s did so much to make it possible for people to follow their government and you know, and to petition for redress of grievances if, if, if they had such, at least they knew what their grievances were. So I, yeah. it was a big deal and, and it continues to be, I think yes, still have to be vigilant all the time. I, 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 one, of my, one of my pet peeves has always been that, that a majority of legislators of one party can go in a closed room and call it a caucus in the state capitol building and we never know about it and i understand that's one of the hardest fights to fight but but it always kind of angered me that the people's house is is a place where you can still do that um i was never able to get traction to <laughs> to get to excite people about that but i'd like to but it it just takes it it takes a lot of people paying attention and and we all need to be vigilant about what's going on because it's because one way or another it all affects us yeah what well, one other quick thing i assume you were there when sdpb started recording everything or or yes you know was that controversial was that hard to implement you know it all it really was <laughs> I, mean, I mean you you don't think of it now but but early on they were gosh they were going to have especially the archives they they worried. They worried. In, in in my memory, they worried about two or three things. One was that people would grandstand. You know, if they knew the camera was on, they'd they'd be they'd be playing to the camera. Um, they worried that that the audio archives might be used in campaign commercials. You know, you you take somebody a piece of somebody's comment and the next campaign you run again and i haven't seen much of that um we did see some play into the camera the first while we, we saw some some people um some people who generally spoke who were reluctant to speak when the cameras were on um i as i remember it as i remembered in the first couple of sessions they the public broadcasting was supposed to run all of a meeting unedited. I don't, I don't know if they ever quite did that, but you know, but the idea was don't let them pick and choose, which as you know, you know, from, from being a reporter and editor that 
that's a pretty deadly way <laughs> way to get news. But that that was one that was one of the concerns. I, a couple of really quick things. Um, there was a guy named George Mortimer from Belfouche who was they called him the the Will Rogers of the South Dakota House. And once when there was a the first year that they were that they were uh, televising. Um, the house was going on and on, and it seemed like everybody in the place had spoken once, sometimes twice. And finally, he got up and got recognized and <laughs> said, Mr. Speaker, I don't have anything to say. I just want to get my mug on TV. And that kind of ended that debate. And, and there was one over in the Senate, uh, I think the next year, but it would have been 73 or four, because Harvey Woman was majority leader. One of his members was was re up toward the front, right near the camera, was really on a roll, very passionate, very emotional speech. And, and Harvey lit a cigar. You could still do that back in those days in the chambers. Lit a cigar and took a paper, went up and stood right in front of the television. And I felt bad for the cameraman because he had to stand there, but he opened the paper in front of the lens and just kind of started reading the paper. And this guy looked around finally and he was furious. But, you know, it, it was only, you know, a while before they basically forgot that these things were there and realized that, well, I think they realized, you know, the the work that public broadcasting does is just like me walking in with a notebook and a pen. It's, you know, or the guy with the camera and the bag of lenses. It's, it's just tools of the trade. And you kind of have to accept that you're there. It, that, that, by the way, has, has really been marvelous. The, I, I used to use the archives so often. And in fact, I used to call Larry Rohr sometimes and say, Hey, if, if you've got choices of what you're posting, I'd like that one committee. <laughs> He'd say, yeah, well, sometimes <laughs> I'd see it soon and sometimes, you know, it, it didn't affect how he worked, but but I just I just knew I'd I'd see it to, you know, to check a quote or or to make sure I got who voted. Um those are just those are things that we came to rely on a lot. Um and, and yeah. went back years and and check what somebody said then it, it's it, it was it was scary for the legislators at first but they you know as it's as with most things they got used to it and yeah. oh, gosh the public broadcasting does a marvelous job of you know legislative coverage just great yeah so the, in your career it's amazing to think about you went from your first days on the job not necessarily even being able to know when or where a committee hearing was happening, let alone be in it, let alone know how people voted or whatever. <laughs> to the end, if you miss something, you could pull it up an auto re audio recording and 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 listen to it. Yeah, yeah, it 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 was amazing. I mean, I mean, late in you know, I left after the well, I covered two thousand nine with the AP, but I left the Argus after two thousand eight. But toward toward the last few years, one year I did a I did a morning two or three minute video uh, chat of what was coming up that day and they'd post it somewhere. And the next year I started just doing snappy little uh, briefs through the day, which was a lot like, you know, some of the early AP stuff, you'd try to get something out and then fill it in. It, it, it changed a lot early on, as I say, you know, a notebook and a pen was everything you needed and, and a place to sit. And so course, uh, we, were using, we were using manual typewriters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just to wrap up, I was wondering, could you give us the rundown and just so we get it right on, you know, uh, the different jobs you held covering the legislature, who you worked for and, and the years if, or, or oh, roughly, okay. you know, if you, if you don't remember exactly, but yeah. Yep. Yep. Just, okay. Just, just to get a plug in. I got my journalism degree from South Dakota State University. <laughs> uh, I worked at the Argus as a photographer briefly and found out I wasn't that good. 
and they hired me in sports and I worked there. And then this, the job came open with the Associated Press in Pure. Um, so I worked there for nine years with the Associated Press covering the legislature, state government and politics. And, and that was starting in 69, I think, is that or, or the, yes, when was that? Yes, yep, okay. in the yep. 69. And uh, Frank Farrar was governor then. Um, and I, I worked then at the Capitol Journal from the time I left uh, the AP in 78 until 87. When I went back, as I was an editor, but I also covered the legislature. And then in 87, I got a chance to work for the Argus leader in Sioux Falls as their capital reporter so I could continue to live in Pierre. I did that until the end of 2008. And then I, I took retirement there, but I got a chance to, to do one more session. Um, Joe Kafka had, had left the Associated Press. And so I got to fill in for him uh, through the 2009 session. And then I was done with that career. Uh, I, I worked for the Department of Public Safety and Information for about five years. And 2014, I hung it all up. Now I just sit and critique everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I saw that you wrote somewhere 46 years. Uh, um, I capital did, one I, way or another. Yeah, I did 40 straight sessions. And then, you know, five, couple of years before that in news. So like 43 years in, in news and then another five in in uh, public safety. So it was, I mean, Pure was, Pure was a, a good job. A lot of people didn't want to come there, you know, to work, but it, for me, it was, it was a great job. I, I never lost my fascination for, for the government, the way government works. It's people say it's boring, but it, it's something that affects every citizen one way or another. And, and I was just found it fascinating. People either, people either like the legislative coverage or they, or they hate it. I, I had one, we used to bring a third person in each session for the Associated Press. And, and one year we had a guy who didn't like it at all. And, you know, and I felt bad because that was just agony. But when you liked it, there was nothing you'd rather do. <laughs>